Dalani, do we have any questions? Yes, we have some questions. The first one is, uh, it's apologies for this immature question, Michael. My love for Giri Pradakshina has only multiplied many folds since the first time I went around Arunachala. I want to do Giri Pradakshina every single day, but in these days it is not possible to do so without footwear. With the development of tar roads of Arunachala, it is extremely difficult to walk around uh, without footwear. If we walk around Arunachala without footwear, the small stones along the path and the tar road cause so much pain to the feet that instead of concentrating, on Arunachala, one tends to concentrate on placing the next step where there are no stones. With this, the entire concentration on avoiding is on, avo is on avoiding pain rather than focusing uh, on Arunachala when cir circumambulating it. Did Bhagwan ever recommend walking around Arunachala with footwear if one feels he or she cannot concentrate on Arunachala during production? What are your thoughts on this? Um Someone asked a similar question about this a few months ago. I forgot at that time, but one thing I wanted to say, uh, I, th I thought of saying afterwards, that is, Bhagavan won't directly give do's and don'ts, but he gives us hints. Um, and when people, um, when people asked if it's permissible to go around in a vehicle or with footwear, in the case of vehicle, he said, oh, yes, the, the vehicle will get the punya. Or in the case of footwear, he said, your footwear will get the punya. That is a subtle way of indicating that the appropriate way to go around is to walk barefooted. Of course, we're not doing it for punya. We're doing it for love of Arunachala. If we truly love Arunachala, if we truly love doing Guri Pradakshana, a little bit of discomfort in the feet um, is not going to be a problem. And very, very quickly, if you walk barefooted, you'll very quickly get used to it. Obviously, it's it's a problem if you if you want to go around in the middle of the day, then the roads are very hot. It's very difficult to walk walk on the roads barefoot in the in the very hot sun. But it it is also not very wise to go around in the middle of the day because it's anyway it's too hot. So normally people go around in the evening or at night time or in the early morning. Then the roads are cool, and um. Uh, when I was there, I did. Um, I was doing uh, every day for many, many years, and often we'd be going in the dark, even. And the feet very quickly get used to it. You, you, okay. Occasionally, you you tread on a particularly sharp stone, and you may feel a little. But it's um, once you're used to it, it's it's really nothing. Um, it's not. It's not. Um, I mean, it's. In the times I was there, it was extremely rare to see anyone going with any footwear. Sometimes when the big crowds came for Deepam, you'd see one or two people going with footwear. But almost, almost, uh, I'd say 99.999% of people I ever saw doing Giri production all walked barefoot. It's only nowadays, but it seems to have slowly crept in, but it's something... Um, it's something acceptable to do. Um, I mean, of course, Bhagavan won't give do's and don'ts, but when he gives us such clues, the implication is that the, the, the proper way of doing it, the respectful way of doing it is barefooted. Just like when we enter a temple, we don't enter with shoes on. It's, it's, it would be disrespectful to enter a temple with shoes on. If we are just walking on the road in the daytime, if we're not doing it as Giri Pradakshana, then walking, I mean, walking with shoes on is not, or with uh, uh, chapels, with uh, flip-flops or whatever, is not uh, is not wrong. But if we're doing it particularly to do Giri Pradakshana, that is an act of worship. And the appropriate way to do it is barefoot. But as I say, Bhagavan will not give do's and don'ts, so you're free to do it as you, as you like. But it's good to... Bhagavan often gives us hints. It's up to us to take the hint or not. So I think when Bhagavan said um, to people, if someone asked, is it okay? People say, I come from um, uh, from Bombay. I'm not used to walking barefoot in the city. We always walk with shoes on. So is it okay if I walk with shoes on? I would say, okay, yes, but your, your shoes will get the punya. What, we should think about it. What does Bhagavan indicate by that? But if we want to do it the proper way, we should do it with um, 
uh, we should do it barefoot. And there are also stories in Puran, the Puranas that Bhagavan used to, to sometimes tell these stories. One of the stories is the, the story of uh, Bhadranga de Pandya. He was a, a king, and um, he, one day he was he was hunting, and he was hunting in the vicinity of Arunachala, and he saw a civet. A civet is a, 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 a type of wild cat, but a wild cat, but has a, a particularly um, fragrant uh, odor. So he wanted to catch this civet alive. So he was chasing the civet on his horse. And it so happened, the, the civet ran the whole way around Arunachala, and the horse also following also ran. And as soon as they completed one round, the, the horse and the civet fell down dead. And the king fell to the, uh, because his horse died, he also fell to the ground. And he felt so, so um, overcome with, uh, with tiredness, he wasn't even able to stand up. And while he was lying there on the ground, he saw rising out of the two bodies, the body of the horse and the civet, two divine beings, two Gandavas or um, some such uh, divine beings. And they thanked him, saying, but because of, um, because of some wrong they had done in previous birth, oh yes, I know, they had, um, they had done some wrong to the sage Durvasa. Durvasa was a, a rishi who was very noted for his anger. So he, they had done some wrong to him, knowingly or unknowingly, and he had cursed them to, um, to be, <clears throat> I know what it was. Durvasa had a flower garden where he was growing flowers for his Shiva puja. And these two Gandavas once uh, came across his flower garden, gar garden and they were enamored by the beauty. And one of them was plucking the flowers and smelling them. And the other one, was, to see all the different types of flowers, was trampling here and there. So he cursed the one who was trampling over the flowers, he should be born as a horse, and the one who was smelling the flowers should be born as a civet. Um, so that was the curse. When he cursed them, they were repentant and they fell at his feet and, and begged for forgiveness. And he said, because you're repentant, I will give you a boon. On earth there's a hill, Aranachala. You will do Parakshana of that hill. As soon as you do Parakshana of that hill, you will regain your previous form. So uh, telling this story, the, the two Gandavas uh, thanked the king. And the king said, but I have also done uh, Giri Parakshana. Um, so, but uh, how come I lost all my strength? I should have been benefited. And they said, no, to do Giri Parakshana, you have to do it barefoot. You shouldn't do it on a vehicle. You did it on a horse, so you've lost your strength. But the Gandavas then told him, but in your previous birth, you were, um, you were Indra, the, the, the king of heaven. And uh, the highest God in heaven. But because of uh, some sins you did, you had to be born on earth as a mere king. So if you want to regain your position as Indra, you you should do Giri Pradakshana. So the king then um, handed over the administration of his kingdom to his ministers. And he settled in Tiruvannamalai. And every day he was doing Giri Pradakshana. He started doing Giri Pradakshana with the desire to become uh, Indra. But as he was doing it more and more and more, slowly, slowly, the desire dropped off him. After three years, Lord Shiva appeared before him and said he was pleased with his devotion and asked him what boon he wished to pray, pray for. Um, and he said, I don't want anything. I just want love for your feet. I just want uh, uh, to be united with you. And so he he attained moksha. So though he started off with a desire, a worldly desire to become to regain his post as Indra, that desire dropped off, and finally he wanted nothing but to surrender himself. That illustrates the efficacy of doing parakshna. But that story also illustrates that the parakshna should be done barefoot. So this was a story, but Bhagavan, it's a story from the Puranas, but Bhagavan also used to tell this story. And on the Giri production road, there's actually a shrine uh, to Durvasa. And once when Bhagavan was doing Giri production, 
um, some devotees, whenever they came to any important points, like the Ashtalingas or any important point, they were prostrating to the hill and they were doing everything in a devotional way. And when they came to the um, to Duvasa shrine, they went round the shrine. Some of the other devotees were just taking this as it's a nice walk, so they weren't really paying much attention to, to the shrines and to doing things in a devotional way. So they just walked past Duvasa. Then Bhagavan stepped off the road, he walked round Duvasa, and he said, we can afford to ignore all the other shrines, but we should be very careful not to ignore Duvasa. Of course, Bhagavan said that jokingly, but it was also a teaching. But we are doing Giri Prakshana, this is an act of devotion. We should do it in a devotional way. So I, I hope that adequately answers your question. The choice is yours, whether you do it with bare fruit or whatever, however you do it, you can do it in any way you want. But Bhagavan has indicated very clearly what is the proper way of doing it. So it's up to us to make the decision for ourselves. And now that person has written a note, only barefoot going forward. Thank you. So, um, yeah, we, we, we have to, Bhagavan is a very subtle teacher. He, Bhagavan won't give do's and don'ts, but he'll, he gives us very good clues. And we, we, need to, we need to be alert to those clues and to follow them. Should we move on to the next question, yes, Michael? Yes, yes. Um, could you uh, please explain the meaning and implication of verse 77 of Sri Arunachala Akshar Manamalai, where Bhagwan sings, O Arunachala, who shine devoid of attachment, destroying the attachment of those who come to you with attachment, graciously destroy my attachment to the body as I, particularly the claws, destroying the attachment of those who come to you with attachment because it is said that our natural will not devour us until we are willing to be devoured second question is there a particular reason why Bhagwan uses the analogy of a mother's love for her child in this verse and not the recurring th theme of marital love is it because the mother is obligated to love her child like our natural is obligated towards his devotees thank you Yes, yes. I mean, in this, in in the case of this verse, Bhagavan is saying, like a mother, it's your duty. In the case of verse six, he doesn't mention duty, but he implies it is the nature of a mother. Um, so that is why he uses this. Uh, he's using that as a, as an analogy. Of course, we shouldn't. We shouldn't. We 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 should understand our lecture's love and uh, grace is something infinitely greater than a mother's love. But in human terms, in terms of human relationship, the selfless love that a mother has for her child is the is is the it's the best analogy we can give. Not that it is in any way comparable, but it is we can we can. It's the closest we can come in terms of human relationship. Um, this is a love song. This is first and foremost a love song. It's all about love because we should remember Bhagavan often said, Bhakti is the mother of jnana. That means he, love is the key to success in this path. We cannot succeed in this path without all consuming love because we cannot investigate, uh, to the extent to which we investigate ourselves, we are thereby surrendering ourselves. So until we are willing to surrender ourselves wholly, we cannot succeed in this path. So all-consuming love is, is absolutely essential. So this, this uh, song is all about love. So Bhagavan is using... Is, is is exploring the the, the 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 nature of love in so many ways. So the love that a mother has for a, uh, a child, he uses that as an analogy. Though the primary um, the primary um, barber of this song is a uh, is a uh, is the bridal barber. That is, uh, Bhagavan is taking himself as a young girl who is seeking um, marriage union. Um, with uh, her beloved Lord Shiva, Arunachala. Um, 
so uh, but just because that's the main theme doesn't mean he doesn't refer to love in the, all its various different forms um regarding verse uh 77 um uh the the literal meaning of that is Aranacho, who shine without Abhimana, um, destroying the mana of those who suffer, who suffer having mana. Um, uh, wait a second, man going to. Yeah, it, so the, the, this verse doesn't actually. It's not an explicit prayer, it's an implicit prayer. He, this verse is just describing Arunachala. Arunachala is that which shines without abhimanam, destroying the manam of those who come with having mana, um, those who approach him having mana. Manam means, uh, manam or abhimanam means attachment and identification. Um, there's no one word in English that adequately translates. Uh, I mean, basically, manam and abhimanam basically mean the same. There's no one word in English that adequately um, translates this. Um, the nature of ego is often said to be abhimanam because ego attaches itself to a body and takes that body to be I. So abhimanam... Uh, conveys the meaning both of attachment and identification. Um, in in more normal uh, terms, anything that you take to be mine, you have ab abhimanam for it. Supposing you you have um, uh, you've got a beautiful car or a big bank balance or something, you feel this is mine. That that when you say this is mine, that is an identification. And so you're attached to it because it's yours. If it was someone else's um, bank account, you wouldn't be attached to it it's because it's my bank account. I've got so many, uh, so many uh, uh, millions of dollars in my bank account. So it's mine. That, that is that that is the abhimanam. But abhimanam can be for anything. E even in ordinary language, abhimanam is used to refer to ordinary, the, the pride, the normal pride that people have, but private. It, but in a worldly context, it's considered good to have. You should have pride in your in your um, in your uh, in your honor, in your the way you behave in society and everything. That that is the ordinary sense. But in a spiritual sense, the uh, abhimanam uh, refers to that ego uh, to ego whose nature is to be always attached to the body. So the ego is often referred to as dehabimanam, the attachment or identification to the body. So Arunachala shines without any uh, uh, abhimanam. Abhimanam also means pride, it means desire, it means attachment, it means identification. Arunachala is completely devoid of all abhimanam because Arunachala alone exists. He's ekameva advaitiam, one only without a second. So there's nothing other than himself for him to uh, to be attached to or to identify with or to be proud of or to have desire for. So he's totally devoid of abhimanam. But the nature of ego is to have abhimanam. So those who, who um, uh, that is... Um, Manum kondurupaba, that that um urupaba can also mean who suffer, those who suffer having abhimanam, having having manam. That is the, the root of all ma abhimanam is the day habimanam. The nature of ego is day habimanam. It's always has that attachment, that identification with the body. And so we suffer accordingly. But if we come to our natural, he will destroy our abhimanam. That is the meaning of this. So Bhagavan isn't directly asking for destruction. He's just um, he's just indicating in his verse. He's praising our natural as that which is devoid of abhimanam, but destroys the abhimanam of those who come to him suffering from abhimanam. So why do we come to our natural? Why do we come to Bhagavan? Because we're all suffering from with the abhimanam that we have with this. Uh, they have imanam and all the other forms of abhimanam but uh, 
uh, come along with this day habimanam. The root, uh, the root abhimanam is, is ego, the, the, the habimanam. So we are suffering because only because of this abhimanam. If we come to Arunachala, he will, um, uh, he will, uh, he will, he will destroy our abhimanam. So, um, yeah, I, I hope that this adequately, um, well, at least gives a, a rough idea of what Bhagavan is saying here. I'm sure when when I come to this verse, I'll probably have thought about it more deeply and will have more to say about it. But this is a very, very significant verse. It's a, Well, every verse in Akshram is significant in its own way, but this is a very important verse. This is revealing to us the nature of Aranachala and the benefit that we stand to gain by taking refuge in the feet of Aranachala. Because he shines ever without attachment, when we come to him with attachment, he will destroy our attachment. And of course, when Bhagavan talks about Aranachala, it, it can be interpreted in two levels. It can be interpreted if we come to the external form of Aranachala, that external form will destroy our Abhimanam. But how that external form will destroy our Abhimanam? By turning us within to the true form of Aranachala, which is ever shining in our heart as I. So the, the part of the process of his destroying the Abhimanam is by turning our attention back within. Because only when our attention is turned back within to see ourselves as we actually are, will our Dehabhimana be destroyed. Uh, Michael, there aren't uh, any other questions here right now. Okay. Then we keep quiet. <laughs> keep quiet for a bit. Yeah. And we can meditate for a bit until a question comes up. Uh, so there is one now. Oh. So, yeah, somebody has written <laughs> that this verse is all in a trance, hence no questions. <laughs> the Abhimanam has been destroyed. Only when the Abhimanam is destroyed do we become quiet. I'm sorry, Michael, can I ask a question? Yes, yes, please do. Um, hello, Michael. Thank you very much. I would like to um, uh, a little bit clarify about um, Giri production. Yes. Um, I mean that uh, this, um, you said that it is worshipping when you go around uh, Arunachala barefoot. Yes. And uh, well, when I say worshiping, I mean it's an act of devotion, it's a way of expressing our love for Aranachala. But exactly. I, I don't limit it to just being a, a, a that is what is Giri production, we can't really, um, what is the efficacy of it, or what is the secret of it, we cannot adequately say. But we, we, it is an act of devotion, yes. I, I can understand this, uh, I understand that this is. The, the act of devotion, and moreover, it is um, also the act of love, in my opinion. Yes, yes. Devotion and, uh, means love. Yes, but I mean that uh, like some real love, like when yes. you, uh, when you um, like, um, uh, not even expect, but on the other hand, also expect something from this. Anyway, we expect that uh, grace uh, would work, let's say, better. When, yes. But um, uh, what I wanted to ask, uh, this uh, can it be um, considered as a, a kind of tapas? I mean, uh, tapas when you just uh, reject your body, because uh, I don't know, uh, maybe when uh, at Pahav in Kahavan's days, maybe this pass was uh, more... Say, more safer in the sense of that you, for example, don't step over something like broken glass or I don't know what else. Nowadays you can meet uh, whatever things on the road. I mean, so I mean that um, if a person is a sensitive one and uh, just don't, doesn't like to, I mean, to, to just punish uh, um, the body with such things, for example, 
and uh, can it be like just you giving away you, uh, the uh, the very body to Bhagavan? I mean, just you. Um, it's like I mean, real tapas, real some some uh, strong tapas. Like if you yes, we we can also take it like that. But we, tapas seems to be tapas only if you're not doing it with love. When you do something with love, you don't feel the hardship of it. So if you really love to do Giri Pradakshana, okay, there may be a bit, little bit discomfort in the feet at first if you're not used to it, but it doesn't, it won't seem like a discomfort because you're doing it with love. Yes, but I cannot understand, to, uh, I don't know, maybe someone understands, but I somehow cannot grasp the very meaning of uh, just going barefoot. Okay, maybe I just... It, it, it is a thing in, in most cultures of the world, barefoot, like, like in, nowadays in, in, in Christian churches, we enter, people enter with their shoes on. Mm -hmm. But in most cultures, that would seem very, very strange. For example, in, you wouldn't enter a mosque with shoes on. I'm not sure about the... Um, about uh, um, synagogues, whether they wear shoes or not, but definitely mosque you wouldn't enter, um, a, a Hindu temple, uh, a Buddhist vihara, um, a Jain temple, uh, a Sikh a gurudwara, you wouldn't enter with shoes on. It's, it's just, um, it is... It is just a natural thing. And even in the Bible, that is the story of Moses when he saw the burning bush. Before the burning bush said, I am, that is the voice of God in the burning bush said, I am that I am. Before that, God said, remove your shoes for this is holy ground. So it is, it's a, it's, mm -hmm. it's a, a, a very, um, it's maybe something we have lost in our Western culture, but possibly partly because of climatic reasons. It's very much more difficult in a, if you're in a cold climate to, to go barefoot. Um, but uh, it's uh, in in earlier times, I, I, I suspect even in churches, uh, people would have gone barefoot in the very early days. It, it's just a natural thing to do. I can understand it in churches because church, uh, this is like some uh, room, I mean, that's safe yeah. room, with, 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 yeah. with, normal, with normal flow, I mean, in this sense. Yes. But, uh, but uh, the other, uh, absolutely, it's something different when you just uh, go in uh, by just some road and uh, you can meet whatever on this road. Yes, so. yes. Well, it, it, but because we don't, if you're doing Giri Pradakshana, mm -hmm. though it may be a a, a road and now the road may be quite busy with um with traffic mm -hmm. you're not in your in your view it is not the it is not a road it is the giri production route it's the way around our nature so for what for someone who is doing giri production the the outlook on the road changes you don't see the road as a road you see the road as the, as, as a sacred path around our nature but why not to see in the same way this road wearing your shoes? <laughs> because it, we, uh, Arunachala is, is the Adi Linga Sarupa. It is the original Linga form. Mm -hmm. So it is like in a temple. Mm -hmm. you, when you go round a temple, you go round without shoes on. It is, <laughs> it, 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 whenever you do production of any holy shrine or any temple or anything but, but it, it is it is just the natural way because production is a type of worship or ador it's 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 an an act of adoration let's say it's an act of love and it's just the natural thing to do i mean i i can't it's something that can't we can't explain with the intellect yeah. but we can feel it with our heart mm -hmm. okay it, it just it just feels so much more loving and respectful to do uh to do any sacred act barefoot mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay okay thank you very much i think i, un I understand yeah i, th I, mean, I think i understand the meaning uh, yeah. i i initially i i understood the meaning i mean but somehow when i imagined so because sometimes you can meet whatever on the road yeah. so there is a...
That is why I just... Yeah. Uh, so. our, our intellect can convince us of anything we want to be convinced of, but if we follow our heart, if we follow, if we, if we are attuned to Bhagavan, to, to, the, to the love that Bhagavan had for our natural, if we, if we are attuned to that even to the slightest extent, then we will understand why walking barefoot is, is the natural and appropriate thing to do. Okay. And as far as the condition of the road is concerned, nowadays, I believe they even have um, flat pavements around the road. So it oh. sounds like it's very much easier now than it was in the past. In, when, in the years I was in Tiruvannamalai, by that time, a lot of the roads had been tarred. That is from the, the Chengam Road. Mm -hmm. uh, that is from from Tiruvannamalai to Chengam. That portion had been tarred. So the only untarred portion was when you we leave the Chengam Road, going round to Adiyanamalai and come back onto the uh, road on the north side of the hill. That stretch was all uh, um, was all unpaved. There was no. It wasn't a tar road. It was a mud road. Mm -hmm. um, that is, they put stones and they cover it with mud and it becomes hard and baked. And it's um, it's okay to walk on. It's a bit rough sometimes. but um, And by the side of the road, even where there's the tar road, whenever any vehicle comes, you have to step aside onto the side. And often that will be stony and so on. So, But if you're, if you're used to it, it's really... Um, I mean, I didn't. I, I hardly noticed it at all because I've been doing it for so many years. For people who aren't used to walking barefoot, it is a little difficult, but it's not. Um, it's. But the thing is, if if you, if if you're very conscious of walking barefoot, there's a type of tension in your foot, I and mean, then even the smallest pebble will feel uncomfortable. Yes, exactly. But if you if you take your mind off the fact that you're walking barefoot. Mm -hmm. And just walk normally. It's it's actually not difficult walking barefoot at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, I understand what you mean. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Mike. Right. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, there are some questions now, Michael. Right. Okay. Oh, so this is um. So the question is. Uh, in this path, we have to surrender ourselves in order to gain liberation, nirvana, for eternity. But I'm unwilling to do so, though I have great love for Bhagwan. So can I ask Arunachal Bhagwan to give me a taste of this nirvana? If I'm to turn my back uh, to all, including myself, I feel it might be good for me to have a taste of what I will be gaining. I'm sorry if my question seems like a bargain. I don't mean it to. But I'm thinking of a way to surrender completely. Okay. Um, I, I, the way you worded it is if surrender is necessary to, for nirvana, it is not necessary for nirvana, it is nirvana. That is liberation and surrender are one and the same thing. Um, so we, 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 to the extent to which we are willing to surrender ourselves, to that extent can we begin to get an inkling of the joy of infinite joy of nirvana. Of course, we, we can't experience that joy so long as we remain as ego. But to the extent to which we surrender ourselves, we be can begin to experience at least an inkling of that. So if you want to have a foretaste of that, at least surrender yourself to the extent you can. In Maharshi's gospel, someone says to Bhagavan, something to the effect of um, complete surrender seems to be impossible. And Bhagavan said, complete surrender may not be possible now, but at least partial surrender is possible. And partial surrender will lead to uh, complete surrender. In other words, we should surrender as much as we can. The more we surrender, the, the more we will be drawn, uh, the more we will... Uh, gain an inkling, or gain an, uh, uh, an, uh, uh, not exactly a glimpse, that's not quite, it, it's difficult to put it into words, but we will begin to taste, that is to the extent to which we surrender ourselves, to that extent are we free of so many problems, problems that seem to us to be so great before, to the extent to which we are willing to surrender ourselves, just to accept things the way they are, to accept it all as Bhagavan's sweet will for our good, then even the greatest problems 
don't seem to be a problem at all. So we, the, the proof is in the pudding. By following Bhagavan's path of self-investigation and self-surrender, we can experience it in our own life. We can experience, I mean, the, the reward to the extent to which we turn our attention within, to the extent to which we thereby surrender ourselves, to that extent do we uh, begin to taste the reward of following this path. That's why the more we follow this path, the stronger our conviction becomes. This is the real meaning of sraddha. Sraddha doesn't mean faith in the sense of blind faith. It's that clarity born of practical experience and the practical experience comes by following the path the experience not in the sense of seeing some wonderful visions or having some ecstasy or anything like that it, it is what we experience by subsiding cannot be expressed in words but it's very clear that the more we subside the the happier we are, or I, I, it's it's very difficult to put it into words. But if we want to, if we want to be convinced, we just have to do it. There's there's no substitute in Bhagavan's path. There's no substitute for the actual practice. It's only to the extent to which we put it into practice, but we can really understand what Bhagavan is talking about. But we can really feel what he is saying. Is that an adequate answer to that question? Okay, and the next question is, uh, can Abhiman be felt towards Arunachala or Bhagwan? For example, when someone talks about Bhagwan's grace, it fills me with awe and pride. Uh, yes, we can say it's a type of Abhimanam, but uh, <laughs> that's a very good Abhimanam to have. Um, but it, it's more than just an Abhimanam. It's more than just a... That is... The real love for Bhagavan is the love in which we lose ourselves, in which we melt. So it's um though we Yeah, I, I understand what you mean, but it it's I mean, yes, we do have a type of pride in uh in 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 Bhagavan. I suppose I, I can I can see that, but I I wouldn't really consider it as um Abhimanam in the same in the the same sense of uh, of day Abhimanam. That is, we are we are drawn to Bhagavan by love. That's all we can say. It's love is something so much greater than Abhimanam. We 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 lose all we lose all identification, all attachments by um, by being attached to him. We lose all attachments. Um, so it is not an attachment like any other attachment, and it's not a an identification. It's a it's letting go of all identification. That is the true surrender. But of course, words are, are grossly inadequate for expressing these things. So some, I mean, it's not wrong to say that, but it's not it's not perhaps not the most appropriate way to express the love. We but, but Bhagavan has. Has um, has um, has planted in our heart the love for him that he has given us. The next question is: uh, Is there a particular route you recommend for Pradakshina? I went around Arunachala with you in 1989-1990, and we went into Adi Anamalai Temple and had darshan of a famous local saint. Can't remember his name, uh, Ramat Kumar, perhaps. In a mantapam in Arunachaleshwara temple. Um, that is in Adiyanamalai temple. Yes, I mean, the, the, the route around Arunachala is the main road around Arunachala. On the way, if we want, we can also go to Adiyanamalai temple. Um, uh, that's a very, very nice and very uh, generally a very quiet and peaceful temple. Um, that's on the way. I do remember. Um, once or twice back in the 70s, that is Ramsarat Kumar in those days used to sit in a man, one of the mandapams in front of the main temple in the town. And I remember once or twice going there, usually at the request of someone who wanted to, to go and see him. 
I myself was never very impressed by him, but some people had to have a curiosity. So maybe you had asked me to take you to him, so I had taken you to him. As I say, only once or twice I remember. Um, I remember once visiting him in that mandapam, and I remember one time he was in a house just near there, and there was some person who, he was having some sort of a, a, a mental breakdown or something, and he wanted me to take him to Ramsar Kumar. So once I took him also. Um, that's the only two times I remember um, going to Ramsar Kumar. Um, but the, the reason we would have gone to that mandapam was only because you, if someone had asked me to take them uh, there. Otherwise, we, we just normally come straight into the temple. The next question is, uh, upon being asked, is the self aware that I am making efforts to realize him? Sri Ramana responded, the ocean is not aware of its waves. Likewise, the self is not aware of, of the ego. Then how can the self bestow grace if it's not even aware of it? <laughs> when we talk, that is, the error lies in the question. When we talk of the self, what is, there's no such, to tell the truth, there's no such thing as the self. There's no such word in, in either Tamil or Sanskrit as the self. Firstly, they're not definite articles. And secondly, words that are translated as the self, they, I, either it, in Sanskrit, the term Atman means oneself. Or it can mean oneself, yourself, himself, herself, itself. It depends on the context. Exactly the same with the Tamil word tan. Um, so when Bhagavan talks about tan or Atman, he just means ourself. Um, it's not some something called the self. That, ma that makes it sound like it's an object, something other than ourself. When he wanted to refer specifically to ourself as we actually are, our real nature, the terms he used were Swarupa or Atma Swarupa. Swarupa means, the literal meaning of Swarupa is own form, but it, it means the nature, the real nature, the actual nature. So Atma Swarupa means the real nature of ourself. So Swarupa, when it's used on its own, implies Atma Swarupa. That means ourself as we actually are. But that is often translated in English books as the self with a capital S. Firstly, there are no capital letters in, in Tamil and Sanskrit or in any Indian languages. And there are also no articles. By, you, by translating terms like Atman or Swarupa or Tan as the self, we are, we are reifying self. We are making it sound like it's some sort of an object. That is the, and this is why a, a big dispute arose for that went on for hundreds or th thousands of years between Buddhists and Vedantins. The Buddhists said there's no self. The Vedantins said there is a self. Both missed the point because what does the word self mean? Is there any separate thing called the self? When we but think about the way we use self in an ordinary language, is take any object. See, there's a microphone here. Is this microphone and itself, are they two different things? No, they're one and the same thing. Itself is just a word, a pronoun that refers to the thing itself. So, so if I say I am myself, uh, I am myself, are there two things? No, there's only one thing. You and yourself, it's one thing. So self is not a separate thing. Self is just a, a pronoun that refers to the whatever thing we we talk about it's we we talk about self as if it's a possession, but it's it's this is all the limitation of language. So we shouldn't think of the self as something anything other than ourself. What we actually are is is what is crudely translated as the self. So um, our real nature, as Bhagavan said. Just like the ocean doesn't know the waves, our real nature is pure awareness. Pure awareness means awareness that is not aware of anything other than itself. So in its view, there is only pure awareness. So the, the, 
if we if we take the analogy of ocean, the ocean in this case we have to take an, an ocean that is the ocean of pure awareness. So the ocean of pure awareness is aware of itself, but Bhagavan says it's not aware of the waves. That the waves are only in the view of others. In the view of the ocean, the waves are nothing but ocean. It's not. It it doesn't take the waves to be anything separate from itself. So. Does pure awareness know us? Yes, it knows us better than we know ourselves, because we know ourselves as I am this person, I am Michael, I am whoever. Uh, that is a, 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 a distorted awareness of ourselves, a mistaken awareness of ourselves, a wrong awareness of ourselves, because we are aware of ourselves as something other than what we actually are. Whereas pure awareness knows us as we actually are. So. It's only when we're thinking in very gross and dualistic terms that these sort of questions will arise. What we actually are, our real nature, is infinite love. So what we call grace is nothing but that love. But we, as we actually are, have for ourselves as we actually are. And so Bhagavan, who is our own real nature, he doesn't see us as separate from himself, but he knows us better than we know ourselves because he knows us as we actually are. And because he doesn't see us as other than himself, he loves us as himself. So what does Bhagavan want from us? What is Bhagavan's will? His Bhagavan's will is that we should be happy because he, he doesn't see us as other than himself. He knows himself as infinite happiness, infinite love. So he doesn't want us to be anything other than that. So um, whatever words we use, we are only very vaguely and inadequately pointing to the what is our real nature. Our real nature is infinite love. Our re that infinite love that we, as we actually are, have for ourselves as we actually are, is what we as ego experience as grace, the power that is drawing our mind back within. So, so when we try to understand these things with our mind, we will inevitably fail. If you want to see the, the verse we talked about last time, last uh, um, two weeks ago, when we uh, I talked about verse 13, in which Bhagavan ends by, well, what Bhagavan says in that verse is, Onkaraparo, the import, the essence, the reality of Om, that, that which the word Om refers to, in other words, Oppoi Vivu Illoi. You who are devoid of anything that is equal or anything that is superior, that is, you who are without anything uh, um, equal or superior, equal to yourself or superior to yourself, or you for whom there is, there is not anything that is equal or superior, Uneya Ariva, who can know you are an actualer? When we know something, we can know something by comparison, by saying, oh, yes, I, I, um, uh, such and such a city is like such and such a city. Often we are knowing things by comparison. But something that has, for which it's not like anything, how can we know it? And um, why is he without any equal or any superior? Because he alone exists. He is one without a second. So, so long as we are knowing multiplicity, we are not knowing our natural. When we know oneness, what knows oneness is only the one that actually exists. That is our natural. So we can know our natural only by being our natural. So long as we remain separate from our natural, we cannot know our natural. Likewise, in the, the next verse, the verse we're going to be talking about next time is verse uh, 15, in which Bhagavan uh, sings, um, Kannuku Kannai, being the eye to the eye, Kanindri Kanune, you who see without eyes, Kanu Deva, who can see you? Who, being the eye to the eye, see without eyes? That is, 
I, we can't see our natural so long as we remain separate from our natural we can see our natural only by being one with our natural so the prayer in the next verse is pa our natural pa means see it's only when our natural sees us in such a way that we see ourselves as he sees us will we truly be seeing him so long as we see ourselves as something separate from our natural separate from the pure awareness that we actually are, we cannot know it. So most of our questions arise because of our, because there's a fundamental flaw in our understanding. We are viewing things in, in concrete terms. We are viewing things in dualistic terms, as if the self is some big thing other than ourself. Does that self up there, does that know me or does it not know me? We're asking these things without understanding, but what we call the self, is nothing but ourself. It is we ourselves are, are that, but it is ourself as we actually are, our self devoid of adjuncts. Now, what is the difference between our real nature and ego? Are there two eyes? One eye, which is our real nature, and another eye, which is ego? No, there's only one eye. The same one eye in its pure condition is Atma Sarupa, our real nature. When that same eye which is pure awareness, is mixed and completed with adjuncts as I am I am this or I am that, I am such and such a person, I am this body, I am Michael, I am such and such a person, I am whoever, that is ego. So the, the real nature, that is the real nature of ego is Atma Swarupa. When, when we, now we are aware of ourselves as I am this person. So we who are aware of ourselves as I am this person are ego. But if we turn our attention within to see who am I, we are leaving behind the adjuncts and trying to look to, to be aware of that I alone. Then we are become aware of ourselves in our pure condition, devoid of all adjuncts. That is our real nature. That is what is very crudely translated as the self. It is not something other than ourself. It is what we actually are. I hope this is an adequate answer to that question. That, that, that is, to, I, I, I've elaborated a little bit more, but, but the main point is our real nature, what we actually are, what you call the self, is pure love. Because in it, in the view of ourself as we actually are, there is nothing other than ourself, and we love ourselves. So every we love everything because we, we are the only thing that actually exists. So though we, in our view, we seem to be something other than our than what we actually are. In the view of what we actually are, we are nothing other than that. So we we. It loves us as, as we actually are. But even to say it is misleading because it's not a third person. It is the first person. That's why Bhagavan said, the greatest of all the Mahavakyas is I am, I am is what I am, or I am I. In other words, what, what, what God said to Moses in the Bible, which is usually translated as I am that I am, but I think the, the meaning of it is I am is what I am. That Bhagavan said is the greatest of all the Mahavakyas. Why? Because there's only one thing there, I and am. <laughs> that I and am obviously are one and the same. Because I, am is the existence of I, and I and its existence are obviously not two different things. So, um, whereas in all the other Mahavakyas, Aham Brahmasmi, it's as if there are two things. There's, a, there's Aham and Brahmas, Brahman. Of course, there's no Brahman other than I, but so long as we don't know ourselves as we actually are, we are not knowing Brahman as it actually is. So Brahman seems to be something other than ourselves. That's why we say, I, uh, Aham Brahmasmi. We're trying to identify ourselves with that thing. But Brahman is just an idea for us until we know ourselves as Brahman. So if I think I am Brahman, I am trying to identify myself with some idea I have about some very big thing uh, or great thing or absolute or infinite thing. Um, Tatvamasi. Tatvamasi is a very powerful Mahavakya because it's turning our attention back to ourself. But if we take it, if we go by the words alone, you've got two things there. You've got tat and tvum. The whole purpose of that Mahavakya is to say there is no tat other than tvum. You are that. There's no, there's no separate thing. But so long as we're thinking in terms of you are that, you've got two. It's as if we, 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 we 
creating an artificial uh, separation in order to again join it. This is why if you read books on Vedanta, there's so many books that say, but analyze these Mahavakyas, and they say, first you have to analyze the Tumpada, the, the, the Upada, but merely understanding about Tum is not sufficient. You also have to understand Tat, and you, you then have to... That is completely missing the point because they're trying to understand it philosophically. They're trying to understand it conceptually. But that's missing the point. The whole point of the Mahavakya is that there's no that other than you. So if you understand that, as Bhagavan says in verse 32 of Uludunapu, when the Vedas say you are that, what should our response be? Our response should be, oh, if I am that, then what am I? We should forget about that because there's no that other than than I. So we should, so uh, the language, uh, language is always a problem. However well it's expressed, it always gives room for misinterpretation because no two minds will, will understand the same words in the same way. So though words, if they're understood correctly, can be useful pointers, pointers in the right direction. Words can never adequately express the truth. That is why Bhagavan said, the only perfect language, the only language that can reveal the truth is silence. Because silence is the very nature of the truth. Words are always, uh, as Bhagavan said, from silence rises ego, from ego rises thoughts, and from thoughts rise words. So the words of a great grandson of the original silence. So we, we, we need to go be, it, it's useful to have an understanding of Bhagavan's teachings. Why? Because they're pointing us in the right direction. But if we don't understand the purpose of Bhagavan's teachings, if we don't understand the purpose of the Mahavakyas, the purpose of all of Vedanta, it's all pointing our attention back at ourselves. If we miss that point, we will go on philosophizing, and that's why there are volumes and volumes and volumes have been written on Advaita and on other interpretations of Vedanta. This is all because people are allowing their minds to go outward. Whereas the purpose of Vedanta, the purpose of the Mahavakyas is to turn our attention back to ourselves. Forget about that. There's no that other than you. You yourself are that. So investigate yourself, know yourself. That is the implication. But if we don't grasp that implication, we we allow the mind to 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 um make everything very gross. And then we get into this idea of the self as if it's some big thing. And does that thing, the self, does it know me or does it not know me? Or, so the, the, to, to answer these questions adequately or to remove these type of doubts, we need to refine our understanding. We need to read Bhagavan carefully and deeply, think deeply about what he means. And most importantly, we need to put it into practice, because only to the extent to which we put it into practice will the meaning of the words become clear. If someone gives you a map of a country you've never been to, you may be able to understand some of the symbols on the maps. Oh, these lines are contour lines, so there must be a mountain here, or maybe it's a pit. To tell from the from the lines whether it's a mountain or a pit, and you may be able to read. Or oh, this sign means this, this. But you don't really know what that country is like. You can't picture in your. You can very vaguely form an idea. The map will become meaningful to you only if you take the map and go to that place. Then you will begin to recognize. When you see the actual places, oh, this is what was represented in the map by this symbol or by that symbol. It becomes meaningful to you only if you've been there. Likewise with Vedanta. We cannot understand Vedanta until we put it into practice. The deeper we go in the practice, the deeper will be our understanding. That's why the vast majority of volumes and volumes that have been written on Vedanta are just adding to the confusion because they, they were written by people who hadn't who, who were missing the, the point, who hadn't understood what the practice is. If we understand what the practice is, if we've put it into practice ourselves, then only we will begin to understand not just the surface meaning of the words, but the implication of words, what they are pointing at. So all of Vedanta, if understood correctly, is pointing our attention back at ourselves. Only to the extent to which we look at ourselves will we understand these things. And then once, when our understanding becomes more refined, 
there'll be no room for such doubts to arise because we, we, we will cease thinking in terms of the self as if it's some, something other than ourself. There's no self other than ourself. We, we are self for ourself. I am I. I am myself. You are yourself. So there's no self other than yourself. The self you have to know is yourself, not any the self, any such thing as the self. I hope that's a, um, a clear and adequate answer to that question. But one, one thing in that connection, when we read books of dialogues with Bhagavan, the vast majority of people who ask questions didn't have a deep understanding of Bhagavan's teachings. So often Bhagavan had, was, was trying to, to get them to see things more deeply. Many of them didn't understand the point. So they'll ask Bhagavan one question and then they jump onto some other question that has no, no connection. Instead of, instead of going deeper and trying to understand what Bhagavan is saying, they jump off to some other question. They come with a list of questions in their mind and tick, 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 tick. They ask all their questions and they go away satisfied. Yes, I've asked uh, Bhagavan all my questions. But they're missing the point because they haven't really listened to what Bhagavan was saying. Likewise, those who recorded Bhagavan's answers often didn't have such a deep understanding. So they recorded what they understood. They often missed the, the, the nuances in what Bhagavan was saying. They often missed the point of what Bhagavan was saying. So to understand Bhagavan's teachings correctly, we cannot just rely on these books of dialogues. Now, it's nice to read books of dialogues. We get something from them. But to really clearly understand what Bhagavan is talking about, we need to study his own original writings. And if we if we don't know the Tamil, if we can't understand the Tamil, then we need to find good translations. Because many of the translations also, because the people who translated often didn't have such a deep or clear or subtle understanding, many of the translations are very far from adequate. That's why we find in these books full of terms like the self and um, I hyphen I, and all these things, which is, is, they were missing the point. They weren't understanding what Bhagavan was talking about. Oh, we have about seven questions, Michael. Yes, okay. So the no. silence didn't last long. No, it ego, didn't. ego pops up again very quickly. <laughs> Such is the nature of ego. The question is, Michael, from what I understand, our real nature is to be, that is being consciousness. In this state, we are Ananda fullness, happiness. But our knowing consciousness, which is rising by nature, seeks happiness in external objects driven by vishaya vasanas. So are we saying that we stop acknowledging any object presented to our senses, or we do acknowledge, but simply realize them as born of our real nature and hence no different from us? They are not born of our real nature. They are born of ego. As Bhagavan says in verse 26 of Uludhunapdu, if ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. If ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist. Ego itself is everything. So all these manifold phenomena, in whose view do they seem to exist? Only in the view of ego. So they have no existence independent of ego. So, so long as we are attending to anything other than ourselves, anything that appears or disappears, we who are attending to that are ego. So we are nourishing and sustaining ego by attending to anything other than ourself. This is what Bhagavan said in the previous verse, verse 25 of Uludhunapdu, where he said, he described ego as a formless phantom because it's got no form of its own. And he says, grasping form, it comes into existence. That's grasping the form of a body, that implies, uh, taking that body to be I. Grasping form, it stands. That is, we can't stand for a moment as ego without continuing to grasp the form of this body as I. Grasping and feeding on forms, it flourishes abundantly. There he says, uh, uh, um, uru, Urupatri undu. Urupatri means grasping form. Undu means feeding. So we, we, we are nourished by grasping form, by attending to it. All forms are other than ourselves because ego is formless. So attending to any form is feeding and nourishing ego. So so long as we are aware of anything other than ourselves, 
we are, who are aware of that are ego. It's only we as ego who are aware of other things. So by being aware of anything else, we are just nourishing and sustaining ego. That is why in order to bring about the dissolution of ego, we need to, instead of attending to anything other than ourselves, we need to attend to ourselves alone. That's why in the same verse, Bhagavan says, Tedinal otum pidicum, if sought, that means if ego seeks itself to find out who am I, otum pidicum, it will take flight, it will, it will run away, it will disappear, because we seem to be ego only so long as we're attending to anything other than ourselves or aware of anything other than ourselves. We're aware of other things because we attend to them. If instead of attending to anything other than ourselves, if we try to attend to ourselves, in other words, if we stop looking outwards, if we look inwards to see who am I, there's no such thing as ego to be found. So ego seems to exist only so long as we're looking at other things. And those other things seem to exist only so long as we're looking at them because they don't have any existence apart from ego. So by looking at other things, we give rise to the illusory appearance of both subject and object. The subject is ego, the object says everything else. So, in all, so long as we are aware of anything other than ourselves, we are nourishing and sustaining ego. That's why Bhagavan said, what does it matter whatever appears? However many thoughts appear, so what? As and when each thought appears, that means as and when anything appears, because all, everything is just thought, as and when anything appears, we should investigate to whom it appears. Investigating to whom it appears means we should be turning our attention away from the thing that has appeared back towards ourself, the one to whom it has appeared. So, so long as we're attending to anything other than ourselves, we're nourishing and sustaining ego. The only way to, to bring about the dissolution of ego is to turn our attention away from whatever appears back towards ourself, the one to whom it appears. That is, it all appears to ego. If we turn our attention towards ego to see what is this ego, who am I? Ego as such will disappear, and what will remain is the reality of ego, which is pure awareness. That is Satchitananda. That is what we actually are. Is that an adequately clear answer? Um, yes, it is. Thank you so much, Michael. Right. The next question is, uh, a few days ago, I had a mouth surgery. I was conscious, and so I was, I was painfully aware that what I take to be myself is just flesh and blood. Since then, I have been in pain and unable to do much. I suffer from the situation, and so far, I have not been able to use this experience to turn within. I just feel depressed and wait for the pain to recede. Why do you have to wait for the pain to recede? Whether you're in pain or not in pain, are you not aware of your own existence? Could you be experiencing pain if you didn't exist? So we are always, we always exist and we always are aware of our existence. Pain and the body of flesh and blood and all these things, they appear and they disappear. That is when you fall asleep, the, this body of flesh and blood disappears and so the pain disappears with it. But why did the body disappear? Because the ego disappears. When ego disappears, everything else disappears. Because everything else seems to exist only in the view of ego. So the, the pain and everything else, all these things cause us trouble only because we allow our mind to go out towards them. We allow ourselves to attend to them. So because we... we we haven't yet gone deep enough in this path, so we find it difficult to resist the sway of Vishaya Vasanas. So what is drawing your attention towards the pain? It's not the pain itself that is drawing your attention, it's your Vishaya Vasanas, your inclination to attend to, those, to that pain. That is what is causing, uh, that is what's making you aware of the pain. So the only way to um, go beyond this is by patient and persistent practice. The more we practice, the less we will be affected by all these things. So there's, there, there is no shortcut. The only way is patient and persistent practice. However many times our attention may go outwards, we have to bring it back within. And we have to continue this practice whatever be the external circumstances. So whether we're in pain or whether we're in a very pleasant situation, whatever be the circumstances, we should be 
uh, we, we should be trying as much as possible to turn our attention within. Only then will we get the, the, the strength to avoid being swayed by those Bishaya Vasanas that cause us to, to, to notice the pain. So don't be dejected just because of your failure. We cannot succeed in this path without failing. We will fail time and time and time and time again. But that is why Bhagavan said the only sign of progress is perseverance. Because it doesn't matter how many times we fail, how many times we get carried away by our bhasanas. We have to try again and again to bring our attention back because that is the only way to succeed in this path. So the, those who succeed in this path are those who persevered. If we want to succeed in this path, we have to persevere. How long will it take? Who knows? It doesn't matter. If we are persevering, if we are trying to turn our attention back within more and more and more, it doesn't matter whether it's whether it's one year, two years, ten years, ten lifetimes, a hundred lifetimes, a thousand lifetimes, we need to be persevering in the practice, however long it takes, because this is the, there is no shortcut, there is no other way. This is the only way is to turn our attention back to ourselves. So this is the only way to deal with any type of difficulties, whether it's physical pain or mental pain. Sometimes in life we face, for example, we face bereavement. Those who are very near and dear to us um, are taken away by death. Then we feel, we, we're not feeling physical pain, but we're feeling a, a far deeper pain. We're feeling the mental pain, the anguish, the bereavement, the, the great loss, uh, losing those who are near and dear to us. But all these we will experience these only to the extent that we allow ourselves to be swayed by our Vishaya Vasanas. So how can we avoid being swayed by our Vishaya Vasanas? So long as our Vishaya Vasanas are strong, we will keep on be failing and being carried away by them. The only way is to weaken them. And we can weaken them only by persistent practice of self-attentiveness. Because vasanas have no strength of their own. Whatever strength they seem to have, they derive from us. And how they derive their strength from us, when we allow ourselves to be swayed by them, we are thereby strengthening them. When we refrain from being swayed by them, we are weakening them. So if we cling to self-attentiveness, or to the extent to which we cling to self-attentiveness, we are thereby strengthening the sat vasana and weakening all the vishaya vasanas. Because when we're holding on to self-attentiveness, we're not being swayed by the vishaya vasanas. As soon as, uh, uh, as we're swayed by the Vishaya Vasanas, our attention slips away from ourselves towards other things. So practice is the only way to succeed in this path. So don't be dejected. Don't be depressed just because you fail. We all fail. Anyone who has followed this path has failed a countless number of times. But we have to persevere until finally we succeed. So the, the, the road to success is paved with failure. Someone who has never failed has never tried and therefore will never succeed. So those who succeed are those who have failed many times. Because if you try, inevitably, but that's so even with ordinary worldly undertakings, we have to fail so many times before we succeed. How much more true is this of this spiritual undertaking? This is the greatest of all undertakings. So we have to be ready for any amount of failure. Who am I who keep on failing? We need to turn our attention back to ourselves. We need to turn even the failure we need to turn to our advantage. Who is feeling dejected? Who is feeling depressed about having failed to, um, um, to, um, to ignore the pain? Who, the, the, in that way, we need to take every opportunity to turn our attention back to ourselves. doesn't matter how many times it slips away again, we try to turn it back again. Every time we try to turn our attention back to ourselves or try to hold on to that self-attentiveness, we are getting closer and closer to our goal. So let us not be dejected. Let us just carry on. The next question is, uh, dear Michael, such a mystery and a comedy is the spiritual goal, the spiritual life of realizing the unreality of the ego. Is it more than, um, is it more than just a paradigm shift between the reality or unreality of the ego. 
what does reality and unreality mean? Reality means what actually exists. Unreality is what doesn't actually exist. Ego doesn't actually exist. But reality of ego, what, what underlies the appearance of ego, is what alone is real, namely the pure awareness I am. Um, so it's not that we'll, ego will still be there, but we'll recognize it as unreal. So long as we see ego, it seems to be, or, or so long as we, we see anything other than ourselves, ego seems to be real. Because what is seeing things, other things, is ego. Because we never actually see ego. We only see, <laughs> infer the existence of ego because we're seeing other things. If we turn back within to see what is this ego, we don't find any such thing. And, and when ego dis when ego is found to be non-existent, everything else will be non found to be non-existent. So, it, in a sense, we can say yeah, yes, it's a paradigm shift, but it, it's a very, very major paradigm shift. It's the the difference between seeing multiplicity and seeing ourselves as one thing among all those multiple things, and seeing ourselves as we actually are, which is the one indivisible, infinite, pure awareness, pure love, pure happiness, pure being, but we actually are. So this is, this is why, this is, a, this is a very major undertaking. This isn't an ordinary thing we are trying to do. This isn't just some small, um, small sight change of outlook. In a sense, it is just a small change of outlook, but that small change of outlook is a very major, it has, has major repercussion because it brings the whole universe. It, it, as Bhagavan said, it's like the, uh, when the atom bomb of jnana falls, it will destroy all the myriad of universes like, uh, like a spark in, uh, uh, it falling in a bale, in a, in a, uh, in a, uh, um, in a bale of uh, cotton, it all gets burnt in in a, in a th thrice. So yes, it is a small change of outlook, but it's also a very very major change of outlook because it changes everything. Or rather, it brings all change to an end, and what always is remains as it always is, and nothing has ever happened. The words will always be inadequate. However we try and put it, it will always be inadequate. That's why we can find the truth only in the silence, silent depth of our own heart. There's a question I think that Jussie would like to ask. I just thought once that um, we are talking about uh, heart-melting love for Bhagavan. Yes. And uh, that uh, it is very important. I mean, it is very formal words, of course, because uh, what important it, it doesn't express uh, the meaning. But I mean that we just have to have this love uh, to really uh, become ourselves. I mean, to become, yes. yes. Uh, <clears throat> but what I wanted to ask, and together, well, and today, uh, of course, we, you also, uh, was again explaining these things that um, uh, first of all we have to have love for our, for our real nature. Of yes. course, uh, Pagavan is embodiment of uh, let's if we can of course we can say this because we have to say something. I mean, that... Bhagavan is our real nature. Yes, yes, the, exactly. embo the embodiment is not Bhagavan. Yes, it, that it, is. The this embodiment is, a, is how Bhagavan appears to us, but what exactly. Bhagavan actually is, is our real nature. Exactly. It's just because of these traps of language. So that's yeah, yes, it, it, yes, that's always a problem. Yes. So uh, what I want to say that uh, uh, I just thought that, um, and Bhagavan also says that the uh, strongest love we have to ourselves. Yes. So, and uh, also the uh, way of realizing our real nature is to constantly direct uh, our attention to ourselves. Yeah. And, uh, and then when you do it, uh, it seems there is no space and there is no room for anyone else and anything else. Yes. And for Bhagavan too. 
because Bhagavan There's space is, only for Bhagavan. Yes, but he is ourself. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. But but it is all about I. Yes. Or yes. I am. Yes. So I mean that um, it seems that the strongest love we have to have for us again. Yes. We understand that Bhagavan is. I mean, to me, it's obvious, absolutely, that Bhagavan is the best, something, the best thing that can happen to anyone. Yeah. It's to me. It is obvious. But, again, uh, the love, we ha- it seems that we have to have the, the strongest love, uh, not even to Bhagavan, but to ourselves. Yes. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, because, actually, we have the same nature as Bhagavan has, that is why, but not that is why. I mean that. Uh, so, so this heart melting love for Bhagavan, it is more uh, to me. It maybe it is more like um, uh, this um, something devotional, some, some like uh, how to say, like this dualistic way of uh, of love. Because I mean that when when you investigate, when you do self investigation. There is no place for Bhagavan then. Um, I mean, Bhagavan Sri Ramana, I mean, in this yeah. sense. Yeah, that is, we, the outward form, there's no place for it. But the reality of Bhagavan is what we are investigating. What about, um, what, what to do with, with heart melting love then? Okay. I'll just give one example where Bhagavan has used, I mean, Bhagavan often talked of heart-melting love, but just one example mm-hmm. where Bhagavan used this term, uh, uh, this phrase, heart-melt, heart-melting love. Mm-hmm. Um, in the verse when when Bhagavan was asked his his real identity, whether he is an incarnation of Subramania or Shiva or this this god or that god, he wrote a verse. In In the first two lines of that verse, Ariyati Tarajivara Dahabari Jugohail Arivai Rami Paramatuman Arunachala Ramanan. What that means is Arunachala Ramana is the Paramatma that exists, the blissfully exists as awareness in the cave of the heart lotus of all different jivas, beginning with Hari. Hari means Lord Vishnu. Mm-hmm. So from the highest god to the lowest uh, ant or insect. That in the heart of all jivas, that which is shining as awareness, as the fundamental awareness I am, that is our natural Ramana. So that's what he says in the first two lines. But it is not the nature of Bhagavan to tell us something and to say, I told you that, now you have to believe it. What Bhagavan does, he shows us how we can find make an ex- how we can find this out from our own experience. So the second two lines is the key to how to how to know this for ourselves. He begins the third line with the words parival ul, ul, parival, which means by love, ul, ulam means heart, uh, uruha melting, heart melting by love or heart melting with love. Um, Paranandidu Guhayandu, reaching the cave where the, sub, the sublime supreme dwells. Uh, that means the heart melting with love, go, that implies going within. The cave where that dwells is, is, is it the cave of our own heart. So it's only within. So entering that cave or reaching that cave, uh, uh, heart melting with love, reaching that cave, uh, Arivam Viri Tirava. The eye of awareness opening, Nijamarivai, uh, you will know the reality, you will know your real nature. Aduveliyam, uh, it will reveal itself. So there, Bhagavan is clearly not talking about anything dualistic because he's already said, Arunachya Ramana is that which is existing, in, is shining in the heart, uh, shining blissfully in the heart as awareness. And then he says, heart melting with love. Entering that cave, entering the cave of the heart where he dwells, the eye of awareness will be open. So Bhagavan is there. When the heart melts with love, the attention will turn within. That is the implication. Because with love, if, if we recognize that 
the true form, of, though Bhagavan appears outwardly in human form, because we're looking outwards, his true form is that which is shining in our heart as I am. If we understand that and are truly convinced of that and we truly love him, our mind will automatically turn within with heart-melting love in order to know who am I. And without heart-melting love, um, he, no one can succeed in this path. Uh, they, they, uh -huh. Once someone asked uh, Sadhuam, we, we never see you with closed eyes or meditating or anything. So how have you followed this path? And Sadhuam then wrote a verse in which he introduced a verse of Murugana. And what, and what Sadhuam said in the verse is, but in the following verse, the secret of how to succeed in this path is given. And then in the, in the, in the, he gave the verse of Murugana, but he quotes, Murugana said, after weeping and weeping and weeping uh, uh, at, at my failure to turn within, when finally, I can't remember the exact words, but it's something to the effect, finally when he rose from within and pulled me within. So the, the import of Murugana's verse is, in, in short, but unless we melt and melt and melt with love, unless we melt in an ocean of tears, as Bhagavan says, or a river of tears, as Bhagavan says in one of the verses of Akram, right? we, we cannot succeed in this path because the love that we require that is, in order to succeed in this path, we must be willing to surrender ourselves completely. And we won't surrender ourselves completely until our love is so overwhelming, but it consumes everything else. So we need to have the highest and most intense love. That is why it's described as heart melting with love. The, the, the body melting in a river of tears, Bhagavan says. These are all ways of describing the intensity of the love that is required in order to succeed in this path. So when, when Bhagavan or Murugana or Sadhuam or any of these people talk about heart melting with love, they are not talking about love for something external, love for our own reality, love for the true form of Bhagavan, the true form of our nature, which is ever shiny in our heart as I. When you understand that uh, the most, when you understand the teachings, right? When when uh, when yes, yes. Showed you showed you the way already. When you have uh, this understanding and you yes. understand why are you going to do this? Yes, for example, for, for, to do self investigation, uh, and you understand that uh, Prahavan's nature and your nature is one. Yes, then you just follow the teachings. Yes. follow the uh, this um, past that Prahavan showed. Yes, and uh, this. This uh, when and and it, I, I think it is like something natural that uh, uh, let's say automatically happens uh, with understanding with yes. appreciation right you you just appreciate the, the yes. you understand what is what is going on what is meaning of yes. all this yes. and uh, in this uh, moment uh, love increases and yes. uh, and the more you because actually the 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 thing is that. Um, I think when you when you when you do self uh, inquiry, you you just you just uh, you just absolutely like uh, is going is going to be absorbed, and that it is just like yes. Uh, um, I don't know. Uh, okay, maybe. Uh, I I think I know what you're saying. That mm -hmm. is what you say about regarding understanding. In order to follow Bhagavan's path, we need to understand his teachings. We can follow his path only to the extent to which we understand his teachings. The more we understand, more clearly and deeply we understand his teaching, the deeper we'll be able to go within. And conversely, the deeper we go within, the more clearly and correctly we'll understand his teaching. Michael, so, can I ask you, sorry, that I interrupted so, you? Can I just finish saying this? Oh, okay. So, so under... Our understanding is not our goal, but understanding is the means. Without proper understanding, we won't, un we, we won't know how to follow this path. So we can follow this path only to the extent to which we understand it. And we can understand it only to the extent to which we follow it. So as we go deeper and deeper in following this path, our understanding will 
grow deeper and more mature and more, then we will understand the connection between the heart melting love and going within. But for people who 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 haven't put this into practice, this is just words. And they think heart melting love, it immediately suggests dualistic devotion. But that is because of a the, the because we haven't yet gone deep enough in this path. But if we go deeper and deeper in this path, we'll understand that the true heart-melting love, can, when the heart melts, the attention can only go within. So long as the attention is going outwards, the heart is not really melting. That's the, true. That the, the yes. melting heart in the deepest sense of the term of will course. automatically, that is the subsidence of ego is the melting of the heart. Yes, exactly. Sy synonymous. Yes, I, I just... Um, I just wanted to say that because when you mentioned when we mentioned when we are talking now about teachings, also I mean that you have to understand teachings. Teachings, um, as I understand that uh, the 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 uh, most important thing in teachings is, is to understand that uh, I mean meaning of uh, self investigation, right? When you yes. understood already yes. that. Uh, the only thing that you have to do is to direct your attention within. Yes. This is actually the only thing that you at all have to understand in these teachings. Isn't it? Yes, but we, that is everything that Bhagavan has taught us is pointing towards this. But when you say this is all we have to understand, to what extent do we understand what it means to turn our attention within? We can understand what it means to turn our attention within only to the extent to which we've actually turned our attention within. So the understanding is not just a conceptual understanding. That is, initially we need a clear conceptual understanding of Bhagavan teaching because that points us in the right direction. But the real understanding is not merely a conceptual understanding, it's a deep inner clarity. And that inner clarity comes to the extent to which we turn within. And to the extent to which we gain that inner clarity, the words of Bhagavan's teachings will become more and more meaningful to us. But... Uh... Do you agree that this is the only this is the most important thing that has to be understood? It is not the most important. It's the only important thing that needs to yes. be understood. But it needs to be understood not just at the verbal level, not just at the conceptual level. What does it actually mean to turn within? Do we yes. understand that? If we really understood what it means to turn within, we would have been swallowed already. Yes. So we, this is a path of investigation, it's a path of discovery. So how can we find out what it means to turn within? Only by turning within. The more we turn within, the more clear what it means to turn within will be. We talk yeah. about self being self-attentive. What does it mean to be self-attentive? The only way to find out is to try to be self-attentive. The more we are self-attentive, the clearer the way becomes. That is why Bhagavan called this path vichara. Vichara means investigation. It's a path of discovery. And we can, we, we can, we can discover only by putting it into practice. The more we put it into practice, the more subtle and refined and deeper understanding will become. And the deeper and more subtle understanding, the deeper we'll be able to go within. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. I just wanted to say that um, uh, everything uh, goes uh, just down to, to this thing. And uh, this, uh, and uh, I think uh, heart melting love is also uh, appears the deeper, the deeper we go within. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Right. We, our heart will melt only to the extent to which we turn within and yes. uh, enter the heart. Yes, in this, in this sense. Because yes. there's a great fire of jnana uh, raging in our heart. So long as we're looking outwards, we're not feeling that. The deeper mm -hmm. we go within, the closer we'll come. It's like taking a it's like um taking a ball of wax close to the sun. It will the closer it gets to the sun, the more it will melt. So likewise with our with our um with our outward going attention, the more it turns within, the more it will automatically melt with love. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. So Mark. this is Bhagavan's path is the ultimate path of love. Pe people think, think the path of bhakti and the path of jnana are two separate paths. They are not. That is, we can follow the path of bhakti 
in a dualistic sense, that's also a path of bhakti. I don't deny that. But if we want to go deep in the path of bhakti, it's only the, that is when we go deep in the path of the deeper, um, the deeper uh, practices of bhakti is what is otherwise called jnana. So in its deeper sense, bhakti and jnana are absolutely one and the same, inseparable. Yes, because we are surrendering to our real nature. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And what is surrender? Will you surrender without great love? I mean, what else would motivate us to surrender ourselves to our own reality other than all-consuming love for that? Yes, which uh, the, this love also, it, it is, I mean, it appears um, uh, because of some reasons when you start just understanding. So the melting heart is... Is it self a surrender? Is it self a subsidence of ego? Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. Right. Yeah, the next question is, uh, what were Ramana's opinions on music and its capacity to purify the mind? What literature and activities did uh, Ramana recommend to supplement our practice? I don't know if Bhagavan ever said anything specifically about um, music. Music per se is... is that that is music can be used as a vehicle for devotion. Um, just that Bhagavan um, Bhagavan did sing, and I believe he could sing well. But uh, Bhagavan was primarily a poet. So, for example, in Akshramlai and the other hymns of Arunachala, Ar he's expressing his love through the medium of poetry, um, and the same can be sung, and. Um, uh, among Bhagavan's devotees, Murugana, if he was a great poet, he, he, Murugana was not a great musician, but he knew enough about music. He could set the, the appropriate raga and tala for each of his songs. If he, if he was asked, he knew what, what was the proper way of singing it, though he himself uh, couldn't sing. Saduom, was actually a very talented, though Saduam wasn't trained in music, he was a very talented, he had a natural talent in music. So Saduam has, um, has sung uh, many songs of, of not only great poetic uh, uh, quality, but great musical quality. Um, so from the, though Bhagavan didn't talk specifically about music, like any art form, like poetry or music, these can be means by which we express our devotion. Quite, quite natural means, because um, it, it, that is the, the right type of music with the right type of words can have a very melting effect on the mind when you listen to, to truly devotional uh, um, songs. Particularly if you understand the meaning, it can have a, it can have a, a, a very powerful effect on the on the heart, on the mind and the heart. So it 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 can have a uh, it it can be um be beneficial, but obviously we that, that is these are more outward things. But the Bhagavan's path is primarily a path of going within. So the the, the Possibly the music and the songs and everything, this is a way for channeling our love. But we always have to remember where that love is to be directed. It is to be directed within. Because where is Bhagavan? Where is Arunachala? Only shining within our heart as I. So these things uh, can play a role, but it it it. it can also become a distraction if you're if you're very enamored by the music and you're just into uh, attending to the musical quality you may miss the underlying purpose of the music underlying purpose of the songs which is to melt our heart with love with love to turn within that is that's the whole purpose of of everything everything that Bhagavan has taught us and everything that we will find in the, the verses of Murugana or Sadhuam or any of these uh, uh, great poet devotees. It's all for turning our attention back within, to have more and more love, to give ourselves wholly to Bhagavan. And we can give ourselves wholly to him only by turning our attention within. As Bhagavan said in the, um, in the 
first sentence of the 13th paragraph of Nana, what is, he, Bhagavan there defines what is giving ourselves to God. But um, <clears throat> Amma Chintane Tabira, except for Amma Chintane, in other words, except for self attentiveness, Vera Chintane Kalamba Ku Satramidam Kadamo, not giving even the slightest room to the rising of any other thought. Atmanishta Parana Iripade, being as Atmanishta Paran, that is being established as oneself. How are we established as oneself? Ourself by just attending to ourself and not to anything else. And that being as Atmanishta Paran is giving ourselves to God. So the implication there is we can give ourselves to God only by turning within. So that is the, what all of Bhagavan's teachings are pointing at, and that is what all the, the, the the thousands and thousands of verses sung by Murugana and Sadhu Om and others, what they're pointing at is only this. The next question is, I find it hard to keep self-attention when I'm in communication and interaction with my partner. Can you please guide me to keep internal, to keep or to be internal and self-focused and yet continue such interactions? This is all possible only by practice. The more we practice, the more the love to, to be self-attentive will be there. Supposing some very dear friend of yours, or, or very close relative, or someone who's very dear to you, supposing they're in hospital, they're in critically in the ICU, maybe with COVID or with an accident or something, and the doctors are not able to say whether they're going to survive or not. It's just a matter of uh, touch and go. Whatever you may be doing, will your mind not, will not the thought of your friend often be coming to your mind? You may be talking, you may be at work in the middle of a business meeting talking about business matters. Still, the thought of your friend will be coming What to your mind. Whatever you may be engaged in, the thought of your friend will be keep on coming to your mind. Why? Because you have so much love and care and concern for your friend. If you have so much love, and concern to know what you actually are, you will find your attention will be going towards yourself, whatever may be going on externally. If it is not, if, if our attention keeps on coming outwards and keeps on being distracted and we keep on forgetting about self-attentiveness, that just shows our love is still at a very immature stage. And for that, I first of volunteer. I'm I'm I I am as uh, I'm very well aware of my lack of uh, of real love for this path. But the only way to succeed is to persevere in trying, 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 trying. That's what Bhagavan has told us. We can all of us can succeed in this path. All we need to do is to persevere. So, however many times we feel we are failing, we we are getting carried away. Um, by by um, other thoughts, other cares, other concerns, and everything, we just have to. The only way is to bring our attention back to ourselves again and again and again. There is no other way. So try to be self attentive as much as you can, whenever you can, and it will slowly, slowly take over your life. But patient perseverance is required. That is the only way to succeed. So whoever has succeeded in this path, they have patiently persevered. We all face the same obstacles, and we all have to, the, the way to succeed is the same for all of us. The next question is, I read something, but I don't know where it's from. It was about Sri Ramana saying that there's not one place on Arunachala Hill that his foot hasn't touched. Thank you for talking about walking barefoot, Sid. Uh, it made me feel more, uh, more like walking barefoot even here. Yes, I, 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 I'm not, Bhagavan did say something to that effect. That is in the early days when there weren't many people about, Bhagavan wandered all over the hill. And one thing Bhagavan said, Wherever he went on the hill, it, every nook and cranny and corner that he went to seemed to him so familiar that he, even the places when he visited them for the first time, it was as if 
it, he knew the place so well. Why is that? Because he is Arunachala. So there's nothing about Arunachala that is not familiar to him because he himself is Arunachala. He is Arunachala in human form. So the next question is, how is it that Satvasana finally surrendered? The Satvasana surrendered. What needs to be surrendered is ego. The Satvasana is the love to surrender ego. When ego is surrendered, then we go beyond all vasanas. But until ego is surrendered, that we should be cultivating more and more satvasana, more and more love to turn within and to surrender ourselves completely. Yeah, so the question is, please ask if love and devotion are not a dualistic action because there are two elements. If there are two elements, if it's one thing loving another thing, then it's dualistic. But in the, the true love that Bhagavan is talking about, there are no two things. What we are loving, that is Bhagavan or Arunachala, whatever we call it, whether you say Arunachala or Ramana or Arunachala Ramana, that name refers to what? That name refers to our own reality. So what is shining in our heart as I, that is Arunachala. So when we have love for Arunachala or for Bhagavan in his true form as I am, then there's no duality there. But they're not two things. We are loving ourselves. That is, many theologians argue that love is always for another, but they overlook the very simple fact that Bhagavan points out in the very first sentence of, of, uh, of Nana, but for everyone, the greatest love is only for oneself. We all naturally love ourselves above all other things. Now, because we mistake ourselves to be a person, because I mistake myself to be a person, I love Michael so much because Michael seems to be myself. But that is a that is a misplacement of my self love. The true love, the, that is the, the love, self love in its pure form, is love only for our own being, for I am, and there's no duality there at all, because it's we loving ourselves. We and ourselves are not two different things. So the the true devotion, the true love, the deeper love, is there are no two things there. So long as you've got two things. That that love is partial, because you're, if, if you if you love something other than yourself, if you take God or Bhagavan or Arunachal to be something other than yourself, your love is then divided between your love for yourself and your love for uh, Bhagavan. Because as Bhagavan said, you have great, however great your love for Bhagavan may be, you've got still greater love for yourself. So your love for Bhagavan can become complete and all-consuming only when you recognize that Bhagavan is nothing but yourself. Then when your love for your Bhagavan is directed within to Bhagavan who is shining in your heart as I, that is the fullness of love. So dualistic love is always imperfect. The, the perfect love, the pure love, is non-dualistic. It's love of myself for myself. Uh, the next one is... Um... Um, recently, I realized that I've had vasanas inside me, though I didn't do anything bad. The very existence of vasanas troubled me. Do we need to do anything to eliminate these vasanas? We all have vasanas inside us, whether we're aware of it or not. Vasanas are just our inclinations. So, the, yes, we have, to we have to eliminate all inclinations. The inclinations we have are of two kinds. One kind is satvasana, the inclination to turn within and just to be as we actually are. The other kind of vasana is vishaya vasana. There are innumerable vishaya vasanas. Vishaya means any object or phenomena. So our inclination to attend to anything other than ourselves is a, a vishaya vasana. Vasanas are not something... Ego is not its vasanas. But it's the very nature of ego to have vasanas. And vasanas of the ego is the ego's inclinations. So um, the, 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 the vasanas have no existence independent of the ego whose inclinations they are. Um, 
so we uh we we can that the, whatever strength vasanas seem to have they derive from us um because if we, we invest our own strength in the vasanas that is if you have an inclination certain inclination so you you've got an inclination to um for a particular you're supposing you particularly like to eat tasty food so you've got inclination whenever um the thought of food comes you want to eat uh, food that's your inclination or even when food isn't available you still like to think of food this tasty meal that tasty meal or that so your your mind is often dwelling on on such things but more you dwell on such things and the more you indulge that vasana the stronger it will become if on the other hand you begin to think what is this am i living just to eat food what is this food it's a temporary give some little uh uh uh, titillation to the tongue but it's it's is this really the purpose of life just to enjoy good food so if you begin to discriminate and begin to um uh, to lose interest in the thought because you don't dwell on those thoughts more they get weaker and weaker and weaker so vasanas are strengthened by the to the extent to which we allow ourselves to be swayed by them they are weakened by the extent to the extent to which we don't allow ourselves to be swayed by them so when we are practicing self investigation we are holding on to self attentiveness that means we are being swayed only by the sat vasana and because so we are holding on to self attentiveness we're not allowing our attention to go out towards other things so we are not being swayed by the vishaya vasanas so by practicing self attentiveness we are strengthening the sat vasana and weakening the vishaya vasanas and this is the only way to succeed but only by patient and persistent practice of self attentiveness can we slowly weaken the vishaya vasanas and strengthen the sat vasana until the sat vasana becomes so st strong it overwhelms the vishaya vasanas then we are able to turn our attention 100% uh, 180 degrees back within and then ego merges back in its source they it, it dissolved in the light of clear awareness and when ego is dissolved all its vasanas and all the shayas are dissolved along with it and then what remains is the pure awareness that we actually are that is bhagavan that is our natural